Ethan, what's the first thing you think when you hear the word consensus? What comes to mind? Everybody involved making a decision together. Okay, that's good. Is it, is, it, is it good or bad? I mean, consensus, is it a good thing, a bad thing? Is it like, like is it something you think we should all be doing or not doing? What's, what's the first kind of impression? Like in a workplace setting? Yeah. With, yeah. with decision making. My first instinct is, is that it's positive, right? Oh, okay. If you can get a consensus on a decision, that means there is at least a, hand, a good amount of people in that room that are in agreeance. So right. I think of it as positive. Okay. Yeah, I do too. I, at the same time, I, it's, you, have you heard that old Native American proverb, too many builders a crooked house makes, right? Too many builders a crooked house makes. Yes. Too many yeah. cooks in the kitchen. I mean, exactly. Like, like, like I've, I've, there's been a fair amount of research that, you know, sometimes consensus decisions get really kind of all the cool creative ideas get thrown away and we kind of dumb everything down. So there's, I think there's probably a pros and cons to this approach. What do you think? There's definitely pros and cons to the approach and we should get into it. Let's talk about it, man. This sounds like a stupid question. Probably is, because, yeah, go ahead. Skilled managers equals high morale, which equals all that cool stuff that you cannot pay for and you can't punish for. When you close off that feedback channel, you are not gonna be able to hear the truth. In the first microseconds, your brain can't tell the difference between physical danger and what we call social danger. I'm, I'm pissed off at you. Oh, me, specifically? Well, you know, just because you're my boss and all. Employees tend to get promoted until they reach their level of incompetence. Go forward and don't suck. Hey, everybody. We're back. Welcome back. Thanks for listening. Another episode of the Managing yeah. with Mind and Heart podcast. I'm Ethan. And that's Mike over there. Over here. See, over here, Mike Nash. Mm -hmm. Anyways, folks, we're here and we're going to talk today about consensus decision making. Um, it was a topic that people have asked us to, to discuss. We did an episode a while back, episode 28, called The Art of Decision Making at Work, in which we covered all the different types of decision making. One of them, of course, was consensus decision making. And I think that brought up more questions for people. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's briefly review. And, and I mean briefly, right? There's six different ways of deciding. And it's really important that managers know how to make all these six kinds of decisions. Because, Ethan, you and I were just talking about a study. And did you say it was Google? So yeah, it was a Google study. Basically, Google ran just a four-year study of trying to figure out what makes a perfect team. And they looked at all different types of factors, including looking into decision-making. And they found that you know some people believe that consensus decision-making is better than top-down decision-making, right? Always making consensus is better. What they found is that wasn't necessarily true, that the best and most productive and high-performing teams use multiple kinds of decision-making, including top-down decision-making, but as well as consensus decision-making. Exactly. And, and in our, in our five-day uh, Managing with Mind and Heart training, we spend a fair amount of time training managers on how to use six different ways of deciding. And so here's the quick review, right? You want me to just run through this, Ethan, or do yeah. you want to kind of go back and forth? Okay. Just so real quick, there's six kinds of decisions. We're going to start with a style one. Ethan's referring to that as top-down. That basically just means a manager makes a decision and tells everybody about the decision. That's mm -hmm. a style one decision. I am going to bring chocolate donuts tomorrow morning is a style one. And I'm get, we're going to have a meeting at 10 o'clock is a style one and I'm buying a new van for our transportation department. Uh, style two, this still is a decision that the manager makes. However, the manager is halfway there or partway there and they check it out with their team to get opinions before they make their actual final decision. For example, I've drafted a policy and before I finalize it, would everybody take a look and mark it up? Now I'm going to take these markups and I'm going to create the final product, right? So that's a style two, and still the manager is deciding. Just because I asked your opinion did not make this a consensus decision. Style three, again, the manager makes this decision, but it's quite a bit more neutral than style two. Instead of, here's a draft of a policy, mark it up, it's, I need to create a policy about um, onboarding new employees. Let's have a discussion. Tell me all your great ideas. Now I'll take all that data, all these great ideas, and I will figure something out. So I'm still deciding as the manager, 
However, I've started with an open forum or asking for input and everybody had a chance to um, contribute. I'm still deciding that's not a consensus, all right? So those three styles, one, two, and three, are decisions that are made by the leader. Now we have four, five, and six. Four is a vote, simple majority. Don't use that a lot in the workplace, that's great. Um, every so often, sometimes it's sort of the pepperoni or the sausage decisions. Then there's style five, which is what we're gonna be about today, which is called consensus. Mm. And then there's style six. And style six basically means I'm going to delegate the decision. I'm going to, I'm going to take this decision and give it to Ethan because it's in his area of expertise, or I'm going to give it to a small group who's gathered for the purpose of making this decision. I've given some parameters, but I've let go. I've given the decision away. Those are the six types of decisions. And it's a couple things. It's very important that managers know how to use all six and that the team that they work with also understands these six different styles. And then lastly, it's very important that the manager announces which decision making style is being used at the time because employees just want to know, am I influencing or am I deciding or am I doing neither? Yeah. As we talked about before, they're usually okay with whatever decision making style it is, right? As long as they know in advance, you know, what type of style it's going to be. And I think that's an important key there. Yep. As long as they know, as long as they know what it is and that they have experienced sort of a range of styles because it doesn't help. In fact, I'll tell you, I worked with this manager years and years ago and we did the decision-making thing. I came back a year later to do my check-in. Here's what I found out. This is how he was using the decision-making model. He was basically just saying every single meeting, this is a style one decision. This is a style one. He, he basically was announcing his decision every single time, <laughs> but right. it was style one every single time. <laughs> right. He's doing the right thing. He's announcing it. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And so then let's kind of narrow in yeah. on the consensus decision making. Again, doesn't, doesn't mean always do this, but when you do do it, there's a bit of an art to it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's actually not easy to do it well. But the value is really high, and I think we should start with that. In fact, let's talk about kind of getting back to where we started the conversation today, um, kind of pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. like, like what are the benefits of using consensus, and maybe what are some of the, the drawbacks? Well, yeah, let's start there. Like what are the benefits then of using consensus? And well, I guess one that I would think of just right off the top of my head is that being able to get people involved, right, can sometimes create greater buy-in is, is what I would imagine. What do you I, think? I think that's probably the reason. I mean, that's the most important reason right there. Basically, people who help create are going to take care of the creation, right? They're mm -hmm. going to be invested in it. They're going to be in be, – because they put their own, you know – blood, sweat, and tears into it, so to speak, right? They're, they are in the decision. And so they're going to be much more likely to not sabotage it later, much more likely to support it, much more likely to bring energy to it. So for that reason alone, I think consensus is really, really valuable. But real quick, a couple mm -hmm. more benefits. How about just the fact that if we don't do consensus sometimes, it's just my, my I'm the only brain involved in the decision, mm -hmm. right? So right. I'm missing out on all this other you know, all this other wisdom and all this other experience, right? Right. There's all these other perspectives and ways of thinking about a problem or a decision that needs to be made. Here's another benefit is it keeps me from being overly reactive in my decision making. It, it slows me down. It, and I, again, we don't want to use it all the time and we'll get to that, but it allows me to be more thoughtful and more systematic and take more time. Um, and then lastly, and if you have other benefits, Ethan, throw them in here. But the other benefit I think is just team building. I think it's just really cool to watch a team grow in trust and respect as they do consensus work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I, am I missing anything? No, to me, I think that covers all, all, all the main benefits of it. So, so given all those benefits, I guess my question would be, why wouldn't you want to do that all the time then? And one that I've seen take place um, when I've kind of been in a group that was committed to doing just consensus decision-making was, sometimes the decisions take forever to get made, right? We yep. spend time just spinning in circles or they're actually pretty simple decisions and we're talking about it for four meetings <laughs> before we can come to a consensus. Huge time waster. I've seen the exact same thing. I've seen because some groups can be overly committed to consensus, meaning they think they're supposed to do all their decisions that way. They just get roadblocked. They, they spin in circles. They waste time. People get really frustrated. 
I think another problem with overusing consensus, and I guess we did refer to this at the beginning of this conversation, is I've seen situations where we're so committed to consensus, the most creative ideas get dumped, right? We, we basically mm -hmm. hone off all the edges that would cause us to maybe think outside the box a little bit because people in the room aren't comfortable with that. Um, it's kind of this dumbing down sometimes where you end up with sort of the least common denominator mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed to something kind of spectacular. I, I've seen that happen as well. Yeah, that's a good point because as many of our listeners will know, there, there's of course multiple kinds of behavior styles in the workplace. And hopefully yes. you created a team with a variety of behavior styles. And there are gonna be some people that are gonna be a lot more comfortable with taking a risk and taking kind of an out of a box and creative approach, like you said. Yep. And there's other people that are gonna be more hesitant of that. And that's a good thing. It's kind of a, it's kind of a yin yang type of thing. But right. if we're always having to make a consensus then we might, it might be harder to get to that creative approach, which could be detrimental to a team if you're not able to take creative risks. I totally agree. And, 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 and here's another one. I, I also see that overuse of consensus. Um, it, it usually comes along with a manager who is actually not willing to step up and decide, right? When I see a group that's using consensus almost exclusively or at least attempting to, almost always we have a manager who has lost a fair amount of respect of her folks because she is committed so much to not stepping into her role or his role in a, of, of authority. It actually ends up frustrating people because they have this boss who I've heard phrases like this all the time. I wish he'd grow a backbone. I wish he'd make mm. decisions. I wish he'd hold us accountable. I wish he'd just decide. So I think you get some trust and respect issues. If yeah. You consensus. And on that note, I've seen managers be put in a pretty hard spot with this where when they do a lot of consensus decision making, people say kind of what you just said there, where like, gosh, like some of these, I just want the manager to make the decision, right? That's right. why she's yeah. there. That's why right. she's there to help make decisions, right? And then maybe she goes too far in the other direction and, and starts saying, okay, well, I guess I need to make more decision. I've seen those same people then complain we never get involved in decision yeah, in, in, in decision making, right? So it's, <laughs> it, it can be it can be a lose lose situation in some cases. Unless you're, yeah, you're exactly right. And what you're looking for is that balance, and that's why we encourage folks to use all six decision making styles, not just pick one that you think is the best one. That is going to be a problem, even if the one you chose was consensus. It's going to be a problem. I, one last thing, I think the the problem with overuse of consensus, I think is. Well, I, I should say this differently. It's, it's groups and managers who use consensus, but they don't really know how to do consensus. Mm -hmm. And it's really messy. I, I, I see people sabotaging consensus, which we'll talk about later. Um, I see uh, uh, managers calling every decision they make consensus because somehow they believe that they're supposed to be using consensus all the time. So they'll say things like, I actually heard this years ago. Hey, the manager's speaking. Okay, here's what, here's what we're going to do. Here's what I've decided. Can I get consensus on that? And then he walked out of the room and told everybody he had consensus. <laughs> right. That's not consensus. But because they're supposed to do consensus, he started labeling everything consensus. Right. Yeah, it's kind of using the power differential in a way that's, that's a bit inappropriate. But yes. That's, yes. That's a subject for a different day. So you, you said that there, you know, a lot of teams that do decision making or consensus decision making don't necessarily know how to do it properly. So let's dive into that. Let's dive into, Good. so you're here, you're with your team and you've decided and you've told your team ahead of time, it's going to be a consensus decision on this one, which is a style five. What is the, the process? Well, let's define it. My favorite definition of consensus is... It's a process in which all group members collaboratively develop and agree to support a decision in the best interest of a common goal. Mm. Now, that's a bit lengthy, but I really like it. And, and do you mind if I just repeat it? Please. It is a little bit lengthy. So a process in which all group members collaboratively develop and agree to support a decision in the best interest of a common goal. Hmm. And I think that that definition gives us the, the hints. I think there's three ingredients in that, in that definition that are really important. Number one, all group members. Uh, obviously, it's not consensus if people aren't present, if people aren't included. And even people that are in the room but decide to leave themselves out of it and just sit in the corner and shake their head and look sour, that's not consensus, mm -hmm. right? Hmm. Every, everyone participates, okay? 
uh, I'm going to just kind of go over this real quickly. Number two, we all agree to support the decision. And this is, this is key right here. There's this invisible contract up front. We are going to work at this. We're going to maybe disagree at times. We're going to collaborate, but we are going to commit. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk out of this room and we're going to say, we decided. And following that meeting, of course, we're all going to be committed to this decision. So I, correct me if I'm wrong here. What, what I think you're getting at is that a consensus decision doesn't necessarily mean that that is everybody's first choice. It's more about what that, that the team, you know, those that don't necessarily think it's the best decision still are able to get on board with it and commit it. To it? Yeah, there's a step right in between that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, what you just described, you know, that, that rare situation where everybody comes together and somebody suggests something and everybody goes, amen, brother. Yes, that's exactly what, okay. Everybody agrees. That would be consensus, right? But it's really rare. <laughs> in reality, consensus is a decision that we work at. And that's the third ingredient in my definition, right? The word collaboratively we actually work at it until we can walk out of the room and say, we support this decision. So you're absolutely right. We didn't all come in with the same ideas. We didn't all agree with the first person who spoke up, but we all worked together until we created a decision that we could all agree on. Mm. Right? That's consensus. So you can, you can both disagree and commit at the same time and with, and that is still considered consensus absolutely in mm -hmm. fact the process to get to consensus i would expect it to take some disagreement meaning that there's going to be some maybe even some conflict and i don't mean you know open warfare i just mean <laughs> disagreement right i mean one of the you know the five dysfunctions of a team you know ancioni's book one of the mm -hmm number one dysfunctions he talks about in this book is a team that does not even know how to disagree mm. and that somehow disagreeing is off limits, right? No, if you're going to get to a really great decision, you're going to be authentic and you're going to bring your ideas to the table and you're going to talk them through. But there's also the adaptive skill of compromise and listening. And, you know, we'll get to that in a minute, but, yeah. but yeah, the idea is you work at it until you can walk out of the room. And this is to your point. It doesn't mean everyone's walking out of the room getting a hundred percent right? Of what they wanted, mm -hmm. but they are walking out of the room saying 100%, I am going to support this because we worked on it together and I'm trusting the wisdom of this group and we have a decision. Yeah. And in fact, I would go as far as to say that there's probably very, very few circumstances in which everybody in that room was like on board originally with the decision, right? Like to get 10 people in the room to say, yes, that is my first choice. That's what I want to do. I, I just don't see that happening a lot. So that's You're kind right. of a, an, an yeah. unrealistic picture to try to get there. Yeah, it, it happens every so often and it's awesome when it does, but it's, mm -hmm. you're right, it's really rare. And what's more likely is you're going to work at it and there's going to be some compromise and people are going to come. And this is actually a question I have for you. I want to kind of mm -hmm. bat this back and forth with you. We come then with this ability or at least the willingness to practice certain adaptive skills. And our listeners know that we've talked a lot about adaptive skills in, in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. What do you suppose are those adaptive skills that we would want all 10 participants to be practicing for consensus to be effective? Mm. Well, one, the obvious one I think is just like listening and really listening, right? Listening to other people's perspectives and, and trying to hear them out, asking good questions to try to get down to the root of what, what they're talking about. Yeah. I, in fact, that's not only the, I think the, probably one of the most important, it's actually really hard to do when you're in the mix of it, right? When you're mm. feeling some passion or when you're disagreeing, the ability to stop and say, tell me more or help me understand, or is this what you're saying? And paraphrase the statement, right? Before you start evaluating or throwing out ideas, you know, throwing away ideas, that you really make sure everybody feels heard. I, I was actually watching a consensus decision, I don't know, months ago. And there was this one person, and I don't know why this kept happening to her, happening to her, but three times I think she brought up a suggestion and it just fell like a rock. Like nobody said a word about the thing she had just said. That happened to her three times. And that was just a, a little failure right there to, to stop and listen, active listening. I would say another adaptive skills that's going to be really useful in consensus decision making is also just the ability to give and receive feedback. And I'm talking about this more in the, the realm of like real time, right? Somebody says something 
right? They suggest a decision, for instance, to be able to give feedback on what you think about that decision, right? In the proper way. Yeah. There's a whole host of adaptive skills buried in what you just said, right? The ability to be authentic, the ability to, the courage to say, I don't see it that way. The ability to compliment and, and appreciate somebody's idea. Um, you're right. I think there's, there's this whole interaction that goes back and forth in really effective consensus building. Uh, how about um, the ability to kind of step out of the my way or the highway approach to, mm-hmm. to, to hold your ideas a little bit more open-handedly as opposed to tight-fisted, to be able to compromise, to be able to consider a different perspective. That's, that's not always an easy way to be in a meeting. Right, right. That openness be able mm-hmm. to approach it with mm-hmm. openness. And, and I would add on with that curiosity as well, right? Yep. If you're so stuck yep. that you think you have the best way of doing things and you're not actually practicing being curious, like really being curious, mm-hmm. it's going to be hard for you to see where they're coming from. That's exactly right. We can go back and forth a little more if you like to, but I'm thinking another one would be trust and, and sort of trusting my colleagues their ideas, their experiences, their perspectives. I guess, again, that goes sort of opposite of the my way or the highway, but that ability to trust and to maybe even take risk, meaning what might feel like a risk for me because that wasn't my favorite idea, but I'm willing to give it a try. I'm willing to go your direction. Well, I think that's a good handful of adaptive skills to start with when we're thinking about decision-making with a team. Yeah, consensus so. decision. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's not easy. And, and by the way, I think this discussion we're having right here would be a really great discussion to have with your team. You know, and in a minute, we'll talk about sort of the skills in leading consensus. But, you know, here's a hint for our listeners. You know, if you want to build your team's ability to do consensus work, maybe start with that question. Like, what are those adaptive skills that would make it much more likely that we're going to be successful? And then I would ask the second question, which would be fun to play with a little bit here, Ethan what would be those behaviors that would sabotage consensus, right? Mm -hmm. What would be those behaviors that we really don't want to see in this group? Well, I mean, a lot of them, you could just say the opposite of those adaptive skills that we just said, but just not being willing to hear people out and their ideas, right? Yep. You're so stuck in your own idea, you're not hearing anybody else. And you're shutting them down, right? You're, them you're, down. you're just, no, that's wrong. You're a lot of judgmental, a lot of absolutes. That's wrong. That will never work. That kind of stuff causes people just to shut down and not participate. I think the inability to listen without interrupting, uh, maybe taking up too much airtime mm-hmm. is, a, is a strategy that I think some people inadvertently actually use to kind of pull the opinion in their direction. They just kind of wear people down maybe with verbiage. Another thing about sabotaging consensus, this, this would be more likely to happen later. It's just bad-mouthing the decision, not supporting it. Yeah, that goes back to the being able to disagree and then commit, right? To be able Absolutely. to state your disagreement. In fact, that's, that's what we want people to do. It's healthy to have healthy disagreements, right? Go figure. But being able to air that out there so people know, and then if it doesn't kind of go your way, hey, we're a team and I'm going to commit and be on board with this. I'm going to support the decision. I'm not going to badmouth it. That's so important. The phrase we use in class often is disagree, collaborate, and commit. And I really like that order of words, right? Disagree, collaborate, and commit. And I can actually tell that a group has reached a a certain level of maturity when they're able to go out of a room and support a decision even if I didn't 100% agree with it. That's a sign of a group that's working really well together. So how about maybe a little bit of conversation here about the leader's role? Because, you know, participating in consensus, as we've just discovered, is hard. It's, it takes a, a high level of adaptive skills. Mm-hmm. I think leading consensus is also a bit of an art. <laughs> I, I guess I would start by reminding our managers out there to spend some time talking about consensus in general with their group. I believe that it would not be a waste of time to spend an hour of a meeting someday just digging into this topic without actually having a consensus decision to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, doing maybe essentially what we're doing right here. Yeah, exactly. Sitting with your team and saying, with consensus decision making, what are the behaviors, and I say behaviors on purpose, what are the behaviors that we are going to commit to as a team to do proper and successful consensus decision making and then flip the coin. What are the behaviors that we're going to agree 
to not do when it comes to consensus decision making. That's a really good exercise right there. It is. That's a form of common commitments. And it's so important that you get people on board with that before you start diving into consensus decisions. I would also say then when you go about making a decision using style five, that you take one minute just to remind everybody of that discussion that we just had, you know, last month at our meeting, right? And in fact, you might even bring the definition of consensus to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just kind of reacclimate people to the concept before you dive in. But generally, right, when you're doing consensus work, you state the problem or state the issue at hand, and you really want to start with a time of open brainstorming. And there's, there's kind of a specific rule about this period of time, and it really is all ideas are welcome, and there will be no evaluating at this point. And hmm. my gosh, it takes self-discipline. For, for some people to not start, oh, it's not going to work, or we've tried that before, or, you know, p- the devil's advocates get going right away. And it's a really good idea to say, hold on, we're going to get to that, but let's create some space here for people to be creative. And in that direction, I would say specifically have a whiteboard or a flip chart, you know, so there's visual. Please remember, and we, I know I harped on this in a couple episodes, please use small groups. If you have a group that's, you know, four people or bigger, <laughs> split people up, let them be creative in small groups first, then come back together. Yeah. Just as a side note, there's, there's a pretty cool exercise that I sometimes like to use when it comes to small group kind of brainstorming. I don't remember what it's called, but basically, you know, say you have groups of three people across the room, everybody does a brainstorming in three groups. And then, and then maybe you have three to five minutes for that brainstorming sesh. And then one or two people from each group move to a different group. And they talk about what they just talked about with the last group. And they either choose to build on that, revise it. So at the end, you have these kind of pods that have built on each other Mm -hmm. throughout. I I like that exercise. I love it. I love that. And lots of different ways of using small groups, but that's a really good method. So yeah, you get this creativity flowing through small groups, through large group, writing stuff on the board, coming up with stuff. And then typically you would move into a phase of combining ideas, evaluating, maybe rejecting some things. And this is probably the most important place where your adaptive skills come in, right? The ability to be respectful, but to be authentic to state your opinion. It's okay. In fact, it's preferred that you learn how to say things like, I don't really agree with that. Here's another way of looking at it, right? You've got to come to the table, right? Otherwise you're going to likely arrive at some consensus that really isn't the best idea because people were too afraid to speak up. Yeah. I mean, if you can create a environment of psychological safety on your team where everybody feels free to speak up and people aren't getting punished, whether directly or indirectly, Mm -hmm. right? And punishment can look like, you know, the leader going, oh, I don't know about that one, right? Or, or, or something like something subtle. Um, it can actually shut, shut people down. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that actually, that reminds me, you're right. The leader themselves, let's, let's talk for a minute before we come back to this. What should they avoid? What you just said, Ethan, the leader being the one to jump in and start evaluating stuff should be the last resort. <laughs> I, would, I would let the group do that work first. Um, we got to remember the power differential. And I, I, I've told you this before. I remember the guy who uh, was doing consensus. This was years ago. And he said to his group, all right, folks, we're going to do consensus here. Here's what I think we should do. And guess where they landed? Right where he wanted to go. Exactly. Right. 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 Yep. He, and, and he told me later, he said, look, I'm part of the group too, right? I'm part of the, dissens- the consensus discussion. And I said, yeah, absolutely. But you also come in with the power differential, I want you to imagine, I told him this, imagine when you come to that group, you automatically get three votes and everybody else gets one. And that's not really what's true. Like we're not voting, but there's a psychological feeling of that. And so you've got to really pull back. You've got to really hang back and let the group do their work without undue influence from the Mm -hmm. person with the power differential. Well, and so I I may be getting ahead of myself here. So just push me back and go too far. But, uh, you know, how do you know when you have a consensus decision, right? How do you know when you've, you've landed on one? Again, like you said, it's not necessarily everybody in the room agrees, right? It's not a voting system or like, you know, six people wanted to do it, five people didn't. So we're, we're going the direction of the six people. Right. How do you know? 
actually, and you're going to go exactly where you want to go, but that first thing you just said there, um, it's not voting. And I think, I'm glad you said that. I, I think that gets mixed up for people sometimes. They literally will think, well, it's six to five, and so we have consensus. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a style four, right? <laughs> and if you're going to do voting, do voting. But that's not really consensus. How do you know you've got consensus? Well, one more strategy to get there is let's remember to give people time, right? You remember the processors and the expedience? Mm -hmm. I know it, it probably, it's probably worth repeating that processors get disenfranchised a lot in group discussion. And it's because processors are more likely to think to talk. Expedients are more likely to talk to think. Um, I have seen situations where consensus got rushed and people really did feel disenfranchised. I was working with a group of attorneys actually just a couple of weeks ago, and they were making a really, really big decision. Um, there's five attorneys and our goal was to make a very big decision about their roles and about the structure of the firm. We spent probably an hour and a half doing consensus work. And toward the end, we decided let's give everybody a week. Let's hmm. just give this a week and, and give people a chance, right? To process all the, all the information and all the creativity that has just happened in this room, right? Mm. So I would, I would just like to throw that in there as another strategy that we don't always have to get to our decision that meeting. Right. On the other hand, I would, with very, very few exceptions, I would not recommend going beyond the next meeting, right? This doesn't need to be a decision that gets drug out for two months. It's a balance there, and that can take some time to find the right balance. But from personal experience, I really like what you said and what that group decided to do with Let's give a week on this one mm -hmm. because sometimes like if we're just talking about the decision that we're trying to make for the first time in the room and I'm hearing everybody's perspective, mm -hmm. like it can be a, a few days before I finally like kind of put all my thoughts together on it and I'm a processor. So yep. that works well for me. Yes. I, I, yeah. Don't rush consensus. So how do you know you've got consensus? There's a couple strategies. You know, there's sort of the straw vote or straw poll. What do you call that? Where you actually do sort of a temporary, where are we now? Mm -hmm. If, you know, if we were to decide or if you were to decide, you know, if it was up to you, what would you do right now? You know, taking kind of a reading of the room mm -hmm. is a really good way to mark kind of where we're at. And so it's, it's just a step. Should that be as a group or should that be anonymous? Did you have a preference there with that? I, I actually do. And I, that just came up recently. A side note to that, I, I'm, I'm coaching somebody right now and she said they've been taught that whenever it's time for people to share their opinion in a group, that everybody writes it on a piece of paper and crumbles it into a ball mm. and throws it into the middle and then she opens them up and she, okay, I don't like it. And I'll tell you why. To me, it promotes a culture of secrecy and fear and we don't trust each other. And I would rather expect people to step up and create us, you, you use the term psychological safety, right? Mm -hmm. There's something amiss if people in my group can't say out loud, here's what I think. So I'm going to probably not try to enable them to hide behind um, anonymity. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that people, yeah, here, and again, you, you'd let people know we're not voting. We haven't decided. We're just taking a reading of where we happen to be right now. So that's just a kind of a good way to measure you know, assess, I guess, kind of where you're at. Well, I mean, it still gets down to the, the central question here is, you know, how do you know when you have made a consensus decision? I mean, that's that, what you're talking about is to kind of get a read of where everybody's at at the moment. Mm -hmm. So then how do you know when, you, when it's time to make that decision? Well, there's several ways, but I want to, what I'd like to share is what's called the four levels of consensus. Okay. Um, I think this is really helpful. And I wish our listeners could actually see this in front of them. So there's four levels of consensus that goes like this. If you're at a one, then what you're saying is this decision that we are considering, I am 100% there, meaning I am so much in agreement that would have been my decision. So, so if you end up being in that lucky position where your group is arriving at something and it's, you're getting everything you wanted, let's consider that a one, okay? A two would be something that's represented by about 90%. It's close. I, I agree with this decision. You know, there's that one little nuance I'm not really a big fan of, but I'm good, okay? That's a 90%. A three, right? I'm at 80%. I can live with it. Here's my concerns. I've been heard. Of course, I'm going to support this. We've had a great discussion. I'm not getting everything I want, but I'm there. I'm with you, 80%. And then there's the fourth place, which is 
we're going to call it 70%. And these, you know, percentages, of course, are kind of random. But this is the place where you're saying, you know, I'm struggling with this. I'm not going to block it. I actually trust the wisdom of the group. And we've had good discussion. And I've been heard. And we've all been considering all these ideas. And the group is landing in a place that I don't fully agree with. But I am going to support this decision. So those are the four levels of consensus, right? Mm. Then when you get to the fifth place, which is outside the realm of consensus, this is where you're saying, no, I, mm. we're not there yet. I, I'm not there yet. I can't support this. And the reason I find that the nuances of that model helpful is it reminds people that in many cases, consensus is not binary and that you can support a decision that you didn't a hundred percent agree with. And so in a practical way of looking at this, I'll just tell this quick story. I was leading a retreat for a group of Lutheran artists and their goal for this entire day, uh, this was 14 board members. Their goal was to redo their entire mission statement, which is a really big deal. I'll just say it's a big deal for Lutherans and it's a big deal for artists. It was, yeah. it was, it was not easy. Can, can I just say that if I had a penny for every time that I've worked with a group of Lutheran artists, I, I would be a rich man. That's really our niche in this work. We got your back. <laughs> who, who, who doesn't spend most of their time with Lutheran artists, right? right? So in any event, this group spent the morning doing small group work and coming back together. And we had at one point, I think 16 or 17 phrases up on the whiteboard. And then we did some more work together, small group, large group, and we cut out a bunch of the phrases and we combined some phrases. We ended up just before lunch with, I think, seven phrases. And I said to the group and I showed them the four levels of consensus or, or you know, with the fifth kind of outside consensus example as well. Mm -hmm. And I showed that to him and I said, look, I want you to look at these phrases, these seven phrases. And I want you to imagine that they're all wordsmithed and, they're, and it's, it all fits together. And your mission statement is made up of these seven statements. Mm -hmm. Where would you be on these levels here, these five different levels? Where would you be right now if that was where we're at? And I gave everybody a couple minutes to consider. And then I said, all right, here we go. You're going to show me your fingers on your hand here on your mark. Get set, go. And we had ones, twos, threes, and fours. We had no, no fives in the room at all, which was so cool because what we realized was, first of all, we could be done except for the wordsmithing and everybody would support this. But the good news was we still had a half a day left to move the fours and the threes up to twos and ones. And we did. And by the time we ended the day, we were at ones and twos. And so it's kind of a long way of saying, to answer your question, how do you know you're there? I think you take readings. I think you train people on these different levels of consensus. You check in, maybe you take a break and that break might be a week. <laughs> you come back together. Bottom line is you have a time limit and you say to the group, we're going to have to make a decision. Can we now agree? Now that, that obviously gets to the question, what do you do when somebody's at a five? Right. Before you get to that, just to make sure I'm hearing you, you can put a time limit around here's when we have to make a decision by, and the goal is to get everybody within the one to four range. And, and the more people that you have in kind of that, that one, two point, the better. But at the time, you're going to have to make a decision, even though there's some people maybe out of four, which still means they could kind of support this, right? Or they will support this. Yes, this is not will. their favorite choice. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and I think that sometimes I've been in a couple of situations where I've had I've had to remind people of the definition of consensus. I've had to remind people that it does take some compromise. Mm -hmm. I have found that we usually can get there, but what if you don't? What do you do if somebody's like, no, I'm not yeah. there? Well, I think there's a few things there. I mean, for one, it's worth recognizing if there are certain people on your team that tend to always stay out of five. Right. Right. And that's probably a different discussion. Like how yeah. do you coach that person? And it really is, I think, a coaching opportunity there. But that's worth paying attention to. Let's hold on that because I, I wasn't I, I forgot about that. I, and I think that's so important. So what you're saying then is you have sort of a chronic devil's advocate, like they just never give in. Right. Person. Yeah. One of those yeah. kind of sticky people that that we all know and love. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I think you're right. That's going to be an offline conversation. That's going to be a little bit of coaching and trying to get some helping them with their adaptive skills. Um, if it's a chronic thing, then you have to kind of assume that it's not about the individual decision as much as, much as it's about something else. So mm -hmm. yeah, good. good. You know, another thing that I might try, let me know what you think about this, is, you know, say there's one or, or, or a few people 
out of five to be able to ask those people, can you specify what it would take to get from just a five to a four? Let's start there, baby steps. What would you need to do in order to get to a four, right? And now the cards are on the table. They can say, it would really be, you know, say you're coming up with a mission statement or something like that, right? It would be this, this sentence right here, I would just need that to be gone, right? Mm-hmm. And then to be able to work with the rest of the group and be like, if we took this away, would you still be able to stay, you know, under a five? Mm-hmm. And that might be a, a good place to start, right? It, it's, mm-hmm. it's showing what it would take. Mm-hmm. I suppose. I love it. It's, it's honoring those people that are, st- I don't mean stuck, that's not the right word, but honoring those folks that aren't there yet and giving them the floor and giving them a chance to, to fill us in on what the roadblocks are for them. Uh, and, and I've seen that actually be the thing that it took for those people, for that person to, to move a little bit. Even though they didn't get what they wanted, they felt listened to, they felt heard, they, they ended up understanding better what other, what other people's uh, positions were. Right, right. Why other people wouldn't be able to make that right. that change or or, or that yeah. tweak, right? Yeah. Oh man, that's actually just got me thinking. That's a really good point. Like even being able to air why you're not at a four or a three, right? Why you're stuck at a five and then being able to hear why everybody is not kind of on board with that could mm-hmm. be enough to get that person to be like, okay, not where I want to be, but I can move to a four because it seems this is the best for the group. Yep. Yeah. Uh, then there's a couple nuclear options here, which I'm going to save for a minute. But but I also want to back up and say, I'd kind of forgotten this other strategy. Before you get to finding out you have someone who's you know not there yet, you might want to just do intentional devil's advocate work. Like that's actually really helpful for people where you basically say, hey, hold on, everybody. Let's talk about all the reasons why we shouldn't do this thing we're leaning toward right now. Let's look at the downside. Let's look at the negatives. And it's interesting how sort of an intentional journey into the devil's advocate world can actually help those people who are there in the devil's advocate world to have a chance to talk over their concerns and to hear other people's thoughts. And so I think that's a proactive approach that can help you maybe have a few less of those sticky points. Yeah, it's a good one. What um, else? Not, well, when it, if it really comes down to it, right, and you're just stuck, right, you're, you're, you're out of time and you've given people everything they need as far as you can tell and it's just, you're just stuck, um, you might have to change gears a little bit. Um, for example, in, if you have to, you could actually change your decision-making style. And I know that sounds like you're pulling the rug out from under people, but everybody will acknowledge that you're stuck, right? It's not a secret, yeah, mm-hmm. the group is stuck. So, so what do we do? Well, you may have to say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and take this now as a style three decision. And to remind our listeners, that's a decision that you make, but you make it with lots and lots of input. And we've just had lots and lots of input, right? And you know, what, you know where everybody's at. You've got everybody's opinion because you've just spent a bunch of time doing consensus work. So in a sense, I'm saying you might have to rescue the situation by taking the decision back. Or, and this sounds a little hokey, you can go to a style four, (laughs) which is a vote, Mm -hmm. and you kind of know what the result's going to be of that. Right, right. right. But I actually saw that, it, it was years ago now, but I actually saw a group transition from five to four because they were stuck and it felt really natural. It was, it was like logical, like what else are you going to do, right? Right. That's a good point. Yeah. And I, and I think there potentially be an opportunity. You're kind of in that s- place where you're stuck. You know, maybe you have a couple people that are still at fives and you can't quite get them to where they need to be to, in order for this to be a real consensus to as the leader to say, okay, you know, we're not going anywhere. Maybe I'm going to take some time outside of this meeting. And, and I do just want to talk, you know, one-on-one with the people that, that are not quite at the four level. And just to try to dig in a little bit more with them. And maybe there's certain things that they're not saying as a group that, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, what do you think about that? No, I think it's good. As long as your intent and your actions aren't about coercing or convincing, right? But but to really hear them out, find out what their roadblocks are. And you're right. There might be some pockets where, you know, the psychological safety isn't as strong as you would wish. And people aren't Mm -hmm. saying what they really think. And it gives them a chance to be heard. You know, it's complicated. And yet, as we've discussed, there's so much value in a group doing the work itself to get to consensus, but also having this decision that everybody kind of owns and being out there supporting it. It's a really great exercise for teams in their development of trust and respect. 
Mm. Yeah. Now I want to come back to something you said earlier, just about being aware as the leader in that room, you know, with the power differential, you know, you, you mentioned like you, you got to pretend like you have three votes in that room, right? And that's, that's kind of due to that power differential. Do you think it's a good approach to, as a leader, to kind of just step away from it completely, meaning saying like, I want everybody to work on this together. You know, I can be the facilitator here, but not kind of air your opinions and what you think you should do until kind of the very end, just so you don't muddy the water at all, right? Psychologically. Yeah, it's a, I would say then it's a range, meaning it's going to be based on the kind of decision you're making. It's going to be based on it, uh, even the level of that decision belongs at in terms of the importance of that decision in the organization. I think it just depends on so many things. But, but I would say, for example, um, one strategy would be to do exactly what you just said, which is to say to the group, I'm going to provide some parameters if, if needed, right? And then I'm going to sort of just facilitate. I'm going to step out of the actual discussion. I'm going to let you guys talk, you guys create, you guys decide. And within these parameters, I'm going to support whatever you decide. So that's a bit of a hybrid between a style five and a style six, right? It's like I've delegated the decision because I'm not participating in the actual discussion itself, but we're using consensus to get there. So that would be one end of the spectrum. I think a different approach would be, I'm going to jump in as part of the, you know, I'm going to contribute. In fact, when we go into small groups, I'm going to go into a small group and I'm going to do, I'm going to be one of you and we're going to work on this together, but I'm going to ask my team. Here's two things with that. I'm going to ask my team to please don't give me any more, what's the word, credence or credibility than anyone else gets in the room. Like I'm going to ask the group to lower my power differential because that's what I really want you to do. I'm going to say that out loud and I'm going to be very economical in my participation. Hmm. I'm going to be very careful not to over participate or to use up too much airtime. So I think there's a couple different approaches. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful. Hey, can we uh, practice consensus right now? Sure. Let's do it. I would propose that we wrap up this episode because I really want to have lunch. Ethan, what do you think? Hmm. You know, to be honest, I'm having a pretty good time. I'm learning a lot. I would say I'm at about a three with that. Like, well, I say we're going to wrap it up and we're just going to be done because I said so. Oh, okay. Pulling the, <laughs> pulling the power differential card there. Yeah. Folks, do not do that. <laughs> That's not consensus. That was style one. I actually, I, I just tell you, I've, I've seen that happen where we're going to do consensus. That's what's said. And the leader participates in such a way it becomes really obvious what she wants. And then that's where they end up. So don't do what I just did, folks. Do all the other stuff. That sounds great. Well, hey, I'm at a one now. I'm pretty hungry. Let's go get awesome. some lunch. Folks, I hope this was helpful for you. And please continue to tune in. One last thing for you. Um, if you like this show, if you enjoy the show, there's one thing you do to just help support us and it would be to just leave us a review. Um, leaving us a review helps other people find the show. Please and thank you. Thanks everybody. All right, folks, until next time, bye. Hey folks, this is Ethan. Hey, one last thing before you go. I wanted to let you know about a new offering that we have available. We are now offering a group coaching service. You don't have to go at it alone when it comes to the rewards and challenges of leadership. Whether it's navigating a sticky situation or finding creative ways to motivate your employees, we found that being part of a leadership group can help you discover collaborative ideas, get support, and contribute to the success of others. By exploring group dynamics and key leadership skills in real time, group coaching can elevate your leadership to the next level. So we're gonna get this going probably at the beginning of 2021. If you're interested in exploring what it would look like to be a part of a group coaching community, please reach out to us. You can contact us at contact at nashconsulting.com. Again, that's contact 
at nashconsulting.com. We're really excited about this one. We've been putting in a lot of hard work to make this a really valuable experience for folks. So reach out to us. All right. That's all. Thanks. Thanks.